You are salt and light. But what does that mean? What is Jesus talking about? And what does that have to do with us? Hi and welcome to St Ninian's in Stonehouse. My name is Stuart and I get to be the minister here. Today we're going to explore one of Jesus' most famous teachings, that we are to be salt and light. We'll also share communion together, so you might want to pause and go and get some bread and wine or a suitable alternative so that you can share with us. Today Avril will read for us, so let's listen for the word of God. Today's reading is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfil. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The people have gathered on a hillside from all over. They've already been healed from all kinds of things and now Jesus has begun to teach them. We heard last week the Beatitudes, this strange list of people, the meek and the poor of spirit and those who mourn, and Jesus called them blessed. He challenges our idea of status and success and power. He goes on to challenge the crowd and us to be peacemakers to be merciful, to be pure in heart. Up until now, this sermon on the mount is, well, it's gone pretty well for all these people. Jesus has called them blessed and he invites them to be part of something bigger, something important, something that they have been waiting for, for a long time. And then he lays out the cost for them and for us. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way that they persecuted the prophets who were before you. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This new kingdom isn't going to come about by itself and there's going to be a lot of people who aren't going to like it. But splitting these two parts of the same story, it's it's really easy to forget to rejoin them again. When Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he's talking to the same people. He's talking about the same people, the meek, the mourning, the poor in spirit. We make the connection and the saying, people who are the salt of the earth are ordinary, everyday people who are good and honest and hardworking. But Jesus calls the same people the light of the world. And that's a bit harder to hear. Remember until very recently lots of the people in this crowd have been sick or severely disabled. They are far from being important or role models or or people to pay attention to. About as far from that as it's possible to be. This whole kingdom of God thing, it's not just about what Jesus can do. It's not just about miracles. It's not just about wonders. And it's not just about going back to normal life. 
This is about identity. Jesus is saying to them, you are already this. The salt light thing is actually a bit of a joke. Salt doesn't lose its saltiness. But a single grain, well, on its own, it's fairly pointless. An oil lamp would burn the house down if you put it under a bushel basket. You would get plenty of light and heat, but not for very long, and everything would be ruined. This whole thing is about them. These people that just a few days ago were discarded and degraded by society. These people who have been changed by Jesus now. These people who have been changed by Jesus now changing the world. It's all about them being who they're meant to be. Living into God's purpose for them. Together. It's heady stuff. A call to revolution. Stirring up the people. Encouraging them to take action against the prevailing powers by living a different way. But before it all gets a bit out of hand, Jesus brings them back down with a bump. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfil. The whole project is grounded in the rules. It's not about doing whatever you want and it's not about overthrowing one set of tyrannical rulers just to replace them with another lot of dictators. This is what God has been asking for all along. None of this is new. In verse 17 Jesus reminds us, you have heard. So what's going on here? Because there's a definite change of pace and focus. We've moved from blessing to possible persecution to revolution and now all the way back to the law again. Here's the problem with any kind of rules. You make the rules and then the world changes. And because the world changes we need to update or reinterpret the law. We make new laws for circumstances that didn't exist when the laws were first written and we try to interpret old laws for new and different circumstances. Scots law is built as much on precedent as it is on written codes of law. That's partly because every circumstance is different. A judge hears a case and tries to work out, well, how does the law apply to this judgment? But also how the previous judgments apply. Lawyers present arguments partly about the facts of the case and the circumstances, but also about which laws and precedents might actually apply. One of the big mistakes we make with scripture is to hear Jesus' words in verse 18 about not a jot and tittle will change and to think that that means that the law doesn't need to be wrestled with or reinterpreted for every circumstance. That's not changing the law. That's taking every jot and tittle, every mark of it, every tiny part very seriously. Every week I sit here having discovered something new about the text that we've been given. And every week I hope that you go away having learned something new, been presented with something in a different way or having a question raised. One of those little epiphanies where something is revealed that was previously hidden. It's because of that experience that I'm profoundly distrustful of anyone who claims to be certain what the Bible means. That's not what Jesus means will happen. That we'll somehow discover the one right answer and everything will be settled for all time. The people listening are from all over the place. They'll go back to their different communities with their different customs and their different practices and try to work out what the law means in that place and for those people. That's what Paul does as he travels around. He opens up the different aspects of the law in ways that the communities he encounters can relate to. That's what the disciples do when they meet together with Peter when he's had a vision about unclean food, when things change. It's what they do when they consider whether non-Jews need to be circumcised to be followers of Jesus. They wrestle with the law. They take it seriously. They never write it off. They don't ignore any of it. They don't change a jot or tittle. And all because Jesus wasn't in any way interested about doing away with the law. 
He was not an advocate of breaking it. The very opposite, in fact. Jesus wants the law to be kept in its entirety because when that happens, we will be living as God intends. Jesus' argument with the religious powers is about their rigid legalistic application of the law, which goes against the very purpose for which the law was given. Remember that the first thing Jesus does is to call disciples and to heal people. The disciples will learn exactly how to wrestle with scripture and the healings show what's at the heart of the law. Wholeness, righteousness, right living, good relationship. The prophets have been reminding the people of this and us for centuries. Just look at what Isaiah says. God isn't interested in our empty, unthinking religion. He doesn't care about our fake fasting or our prayers full of platitudes. The people would have been stunned to hear that their righteousness had to exceed that of the Pharisees. And that's not Jesus making a joke. The Pharisees were seen as the most righteous of all people because they were the ones who dealt with the law, the ones who said what it meant. They were the guardians of righteousness. But Jesus is laying down a different challenge. It's you. You are the people. You're the people that God has chosen, all of you, everyone. But you have work to do. You have to take seriously your place in learning and interpreting scripture together. You have to take seriously the responsibility of being salt and light to the world together. You have to make that real together. But how? How does that happen? Well, Isaiah points the way. What does God want of us? To break the chains of injustice. To get rid of exploitation in the workplace. To free the oppressed. To cancel debts. What God is interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry. Inviting the homeless poor into your homes. Putting clothes on the shivering ill clad. Being available to our own families. Do this and the lights will turn on and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. You can get rid of unfair practices. Quit blaming victims. Quit gossiping about other people's sins. If you're generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow, to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. God will always show us where to go. God will give us a full life, even in the emptiest of places, firm muscles and strong bones. We'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. We'll use up the old rubble of our past lives to build anew, to rebuild the foundations from out of our past. We'll be the ones known as those who can fix anything, who can restore old ruins and rebuild and renovate, that we can make our communities livable again. But it's up to us. It's up to us to do that together. Knowing that we are never alone. For when we pray, God will answer. When we call out for help, God will say, Here I am. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It's made ready for those who love him and want to love him more. So come. You who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time or perhaps never before. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, not because it's me who invites you, 
but because our Lord invites all of us. It's his will that those who seek him should meet him here. Here and now as we gather, God is with us all. We remember another table long ago and far away. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he sat at supper with his disciples. And while they were eating, he took a piece of bread and said a blessing. He broke it and he gave it to them with the words, This is my body. It's broken for you. Do this to remember me. Later, he took a cup of wine saying, This cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood. Drink from it, all of you, and remember me. So now, following Jesus' example and command, we take this bread and this wine, the ordinary things of the world, which Christ will make special. And as he said a prayer before sharing, let us do the same. With gratitude and praise, hearts lifted high, voices full and joyful, these you deserve, O oh God. For when we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name, no faith, no future, you called us your children. When we lost our way and turned away, you did not abandon us. And when we came back to you, you opened your arms wide and welcome. And look, you prepare a table for us, offering not just bread, not just wine, but your very self, so that we might be filled and forgiven, healed and blessed and made new again. You are worth all our pain and all our praise. So now, now in gratitude we join our voices to those of the church on earth and in heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. He came proclaiming your salvation, God of holiness your child of salt and light. For those in the shadows of mourning, he brought light. For those whose lives had crumbled around them, he rebuilt their hopes. For those who are separated by the claims, for those who are separated by chasms of fear, he stretched a bridge so that they can meet each other in harmony. For all, his, for all who face death's uncertainty, he went into that unknown, coming forth to reassure us that its power had been broken. So as we seek to see him in our midst, as we try to hear your words of life, we trust it. As we seek to see him in our midst, as we try to hear your word of life, we trust in that faith which is mysterious. Christ died, showing us the way to death. Christ was raised, showing us the way to new life. Christ will come to show us the way to your heart. Here at the table of grace, the Holy Spirit proclaims life, transforming these simple gifts and the people gathered all around. As we taste the hope of the broken bread, we would go to break the bonds of injustice and free the oppressed. So doing as Jesus commanded, we take bread and having given thanks to God, we break it and share it. And as we share it, making sure that everyone has a piece, we practice the generosity of heaven. After supper, Jesus took a cup of wine, gave thanks as we have given thanks and shared it with his friends. As we are filled with the cup, we become one with Christ and with each other. Each one of us, a beloved child of God. This cup, is the new covenant in the blood of Christ, shed for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sin. Drink it, all of you, in remembrance of him. 
not an easy peace, not an insignificant peace, not a half-hearted peace, but the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with us now. Peace be with you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is gracious and his mercy endures forever. Creator God, your steadfast purpose is the completion of the things of your Son. May we have received the pledge of the kingdom, live by faith, walk in hope, and be renewed in love until the world reflects your glory. And you are all in all, through Jesus Christ our Lord. What can I give? What can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? What can be sung as a praise of your name for the things you have done? Oh, my words could not tell.
Following Jesus is not about finding ourselves or even seeking the meaning of life. It's about opening our eyes to the world around us, to see the need of our neighbour, to pick up the unspoken cues, the longing behind the smile, the spark that is no longer there, extinguished when hope took flight. Following Jesus is about recognising our kinship with the man and his dog begging on the city streets, or the young woman sitting in the shop doorway, or the elderly veteran whose once proud bearing is now stooped and dejected. Following Jesus does not require us to travel far physically, but to take huge steps in our understanding of our sisters and brothers who make this pilgrimage with us, to bear their burdens and lighten the load with love and grace, lived out in mercy and compassion, with steps more faltering than sure, and a hunger born of justice. This is what God requires of us. So we pray that we might be salt and light to the world around us. Amen. To those huddled in the shadows of fear and worry, God sends us to be light. To those whose lives and hopes have lost all flavour, Jesus sends us to be salt. To society where love is tossed aside as easily as a food wrapper, the Holy Spirit sends us to be faithful carers to everyone we meet. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. The food bank opens for collection on Sunday from 1pm until 2.30pm and every Sunday thereafter. Uh, obviously it's been Christmas and New Year so stocks are low so any donations that you could bring to the food bank would be very gratefully appreciated. And don't forget if you or anyone you know needs food then they can come and collect food at the same time from 1pm until 2.30pm every Sunday at St Ninian's Church. And in the evening of the 5th of February, it's Night Church. It's an opportunity for you to come to St Ninian's Church to drop in, to spend as long or as short a time as you want in the peace and the quiet and the beauty of our church. That's from 7.30 until 9pm and you can stay for as long a time or as short a time as you wish. Mm-hmm.